tweets, uh, which is my favourite subject. And uh, it's a shame about the big pictures, but uh, yeah, the pictures are, would be nice. But anyway, maybe you can see them just enough. And uh, so this is this first one is a picture of a uh, confectioner in the 19th century. It's a painting. Um, by, who was it? Jean Brendes, it's uh, it a Maltese painter. And we go, that one. And then the next picture is a picture of confectioners in the 16th century on a float, uh, a, a sort of wheeled cart in a procession for a circumcision ceremony. And you can see the, uh, the sugar, loaves of sugar, the conical loaves of sugar. And there, there's a parrot in the bottom corner. I don't know if you can see it. There's a little picture of a parrot. And that must be the symbol of the confectioners because parrots were supposed to love sugar and when they taught them to speak, they gave them sugar. And in a lot of poetry, like in Mevlana's poetry, which is mostly in Persian, also in Turkish poetry, they often talk about parrots loving sugar. And I just got two... Um, two things about that for you. One is, this is from Mevlana, he says, the parrots of love took wing because sugar is arriving in loads from Egypt. And then the other one is a poet from the 15th century, who was from Bursa, and he, in his poem he says, he is a parrot desirous to reach the place where sugar is found. So for some reason that's the, the parrot there. And sweets were very important in a Turkish but Islamic culture because uh, it had this symbolic meaning like when Medlana talks about sweets and sugar he's talking about sort of spiritual awareness and uh, the love of uh, love of God when he talks about sugar and it became uh, a sort of a, a symbol for if you're, you're, you're a child is born you, you have sugar as presents or you get married there's sugar and uh, you get circumcised the sugar, and even when you die, the, the people make halva or uh, little do round donuts called lokma. So uh, all through people's lives, it's something important. Of course, not many people maybe eat sugar all the time, so it's a special occasion. And like even when children began school, uh, they would make a, some sort of sweet to celebrate. And there's a Turkish novelist who... He, he, called Aziz Nesin, I don't know if you've heard of him, and he wrote, he wrote uh, short stories and novels, and they were humorous mainly, but with some uh, sharp uh, things underneath as well. And he wrote in his autobiography, when he started school, I think uh, around 1915, his mother wanted to make the teacher some baklava, but she couldn't afford the sugar. And so she had to make uh, barrette with cheese in it instead. And she was very upset because she couldn't afford to give the teacher the butler, which would have had more meaning uh, for when he was starting school. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad is supposed to have said, but I did talk to a theologian and he thought that this was probably actually a later, uh, not an authentic tradition of the Prophet in fact, that probably it was invented later. But, Mohammed is supposed to have said, uh, loving sweets is an article of faith, and also the faithful are like Helva. <laughs> uh, yes, but it, they don't know. And uh, to, to, why Turkish confectionery is especially interesting compared to, of course, lots of places have a, an interesting confectionery culture, but Turkey's is very interesting because it, has, it comes from so many uh, different sources. Some of them are very ancient, so uh, the variety is really extraordinary because they have the, the Persian uh, tradition and the uh, Middle East, medieval Arab tradition and some of them go back to India and then some uh, from Byzantine Roman culture like uh, Revani, I don't know if you've eaten it, it's like a cake with syrup on it. There's a recipe <coughs> Uh, from Constantinople in the 13th century, so that was probably the Byzantine contribution to it. So it's a very rich culture, and quite a lot of things were invented also in Ottoman times, like uh, this uh, <clears throat> Ekmek Kadayifa, for example. It's quite a late invention, and also Turkish delight, Lokum. It has 
ancestry going back to earlier things, but Lokum itself is, dates from the Ottoman period. And then the next picture, that is the, it's a very famous, I'm sure everybody's seen it, it's the famous picture by Preziosi of a uh, confection shop in Istanbul in the middle of the 19th century. It's probably, they think it's probably Hajabekia, that famous confection, but who knows, it could be any, because there were many uh, confection shops at the time. And <clears throat> you can see the, I don't, I'm going to, you afterwards you'll eat these things called sujuk, they're made of grape juice thickened with starch and dip, with strings of nuts dipped in them and you can see them hanging from the roof of the shop <coughs> there. Actually the shop is very beautiful but the picture's too small to see the details. And these are sugar gardens and from the 15th century onwards when they had uh, circumcisions especially, the sultans had circumcisions, uh, and occasionally there's some reports that very rich people, private individuals also did it, when, they, when their daughters got married or their sons were circumcised, you have these um, models, sugar models. So uh, these are uh, 17th century pictures, there's one here and there's the ne next one, you can't see the details now of course, but they're sugar gardens and in the, uh, with They've got trees with fruits on, which would be made of marzipan or, or just or, or sugar and pet little. They have little pools made with sherbet in them instead of water, and the soil is made of sugar and musk mixed together. And the pebbles are made of sugared almonds. It's, everything is edible. So after the procession, it would be uh, people would be allowed to sort of attack it and break off as much as they could and eat it. And like for, uh, in 1457, when they met the conqueror's sons, Bayezid and Mustafa, were circumcised, they, they had sugar mosques, castles, pavilions, and meadows of flowers, made of, all made of sugar. And so they also had sugar animals, which are again very small, but they had loads of uh, sugar animals paraded through the streets in the 16th up to the 17th century. And in fact, later too, in the early 19th century, even, and the, they even had, as well as giraffes, monkeys, lions, tigers, elephants, camels, storks, vultures, all kinds of animals, which uh, like little statues and painted. And but they also had things like backgammon and chess sets made of sugar as well. And there's a, a an Englishman who came and watched one of these. Uh, processions for a circumcision in 1675, that's Dr. Covell, and he, he saw ostriches, peacocks, swans, pelicans, lions, bears, greyhounds, deer, horses, etc, etc. And the next, uh, the next picture, I don't know if you've ever eaten these, in Turkish they're called nobet shekeri. <laughs> <coughs> and the English is sugar candy or rock sugar, and they're like um, strings with these big sugar crystals on them, and they're not uh, specific to Turkey. They're a very old kind of sweet that was known all over uh, Europe and the East and India, everywhere. It's a very ancient uh, type of sweet, and it was used medicinally as well, or if you were rich enough to afford it, you could use it because it was very pure sugar. And the, the, there's a Turkish legend about how a, a confectioner's apprentice uh, made the sugar syrup. He did something wrong. And he was afraid of his master, so he poured it into a hole in the stable and covered it up to hide it. And then, the, uh, then the, somehow it was found, and it turned out all these crystals in it. That's the, just the Turkish legend, but in fact, it's very ancient. And it seems to go back to... India, but they didn't use strings. This is a later development in sort of the 16th century. Before that, they used to put sticks into the sugar syrup or a palm frond, something like that. And then they, you cover it with sort of blankets or felt and bury it. Uh, the idea of burying it in the stable in the manure is because that creates heat. So it keeps it warm, and that's what uh, enables the crystals to form. And the most ancient thing that 
sounds like this, is a, uh, a Greek person called Megasthenes. I can't remember what he was. This is uh, 3rd century BC. And uh, he travelled, huh, he was the envoy of Alexander the Great, uh, of no, uh, Seleucus the First, who reigned after Alexander the Great, and he goes to India, and he writes that they dug up stones the colour of frankincense and sweeter than figs or honey. And that really sounds like these. Uh, I think that is what it is, that they're making these in the ground. So it shows it goes back maybe two and a half thousand years. And then the next suite I want to do, this is a painting actually by a Turkish painter called um, uh, Hoca Ali Riza. Mm -hmm. And it's a scene of Ra in Ramazan when you break the fast. So you, and when you break the fast you have just a little meal of little bits of jam and uh, soup and uh, cheese and olives and some dates, things like that. And j jam was very important in this. And jam is not like today where you just have a piece of bread and you spread your jam on it. They're, the jam was a true sweetmeat. So if you made a really good um, sweetmeat, you'll give it to your guests like you would offer chocolate today. So they're really, uh, this is a valuable and also much more nutritious than chocolate, of course. And so you make some beautiful jam, and when your guests come, people used to offer them either in a spoon or on a fork. So if it was like, um, if it's fig jam, you could offer, you could take one piece. And that was your, like offering sweets around. So th this, this is just shows the table uh, laid with two kinds of jams, one of which looks like um, the orange peel um, rolled up into spirals. And then, this is a cartoon from the early 20th century. It's a Caragos magazine. There was a Caragos magazine. It's a political, really, a political uh, magazine that started in 1909. And this cartoon actually has a political significance because the, the jars of jam have the names of different government departments on them. So he's actually mm -hmm. criticizing the government, this cartoon is. But the point is that it shows um, people, it shows somebody buying jam for the home during Ramazan because you needed to have, you wanted, if you hadn't made your own jam, so you went to the confectioner and the confectioner would have loads of different jams and you can see the, the person who is the, who is the um, customer, he's got his own little pot and he's taking it to the confectioners and you just, say which kind of jam you want, and you'd buy it from the confectioner's shop. So this cartoon is actually, a, there isn't another picture of showing this. It's lucky that you know, they found some political sort of um, symbolism uh, to use for it, and so did a picture, otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a picture of that. It's, and then, yes, this is a, this, that sort of tray, a silver tray with the jam, holders and the glasses with the spoons in and the glasses for water, that belongs to a lady <coughs> in Antalya. So when you have visitors you can, you first offer them sweet and then the coffee. So you, you eat something sweet and then people didn't really put sugar in coffee in the past, they, they would just have the sweet first. And uh, a very nice custom I think uh, that needs to be revived. And. The next one, this is a black and white photo, I'm afraid, so it's very difficult to see. It's a pity. It's a, a 1940s photo from Bapers era, mm -hmm. and it's making the sujuk. Ah, oh, we could have shown the sujuk themselves, but maybe you know them. They sell a lot in Eminem. They're like long sausages, but they're made of the grape syrup. And that is a lady in Bapers era making them. So she's got her strings of nuts and she's dipping them into her cauldron there and then uh, this is pictures um, of different places they make them in so many places in Turkey so everyone looks slightly different uh, some of them are more transparent some of them have a sort of a, a dusty sort of sugar sort of glazed surface some of them are light brown dark but everyone's different depending on the way they cook them and the grapes but uh, they make them in gümüş which is 
uh, on the northeast of Turkey, and they make them in the southeast provinces, and they make them in uh, Beypazar, which is Ankara, and uh, I don't know whether they still do, but uh, the Trakya, the Thrace, west of Istanbul, that area was also a big, everywhere, they made them everywhere, yeah. maybe Bursa some places. Also. Ah, Bursa also. Yeah, I, think, I think there isn't a place that grows grapes that they don't make this. Oh, Cappadocia, they do, do they? Yes, I think it would be interesting just to study this really and go around Anatolia because everywhere they make it then, and, or, or at least used to it, and they all have a slightly different flavour. Like the ones um, in Gumushani, for instance, they don't always use grape juice, they sometimes use mulberry juice. Yes. And the one of them, oh, it isn't on this page, these are from Batman, Elazığ, Gaziantep, and Adana, that's all southeast Turkey, but um, this one is one, the one at the bottom right, that's the kind they make in Gumushani, they make the ones with the whole nuts on the string and they make this with the chopped up nuts, but they uh, put it in and they still make it in a sausage shape, but with the mulberry juice. And it's, um, that's just an Eminino picture I took. And this is one from Malacca, which looks, because they make little pieces of wood, so they do two at a time, and the little pieces of wood are also covered with the syrup. And these are mentioned in the, um, they, they must be a very ancient, Sweet meat. I mean, I don't know how ancient. The earliest I could go back was the fifth, early 15th century, and this a French pilgrim called Bertrand de Le Brocier, he he went to the Holy Land, and instead of going back with his companions by ship, he did, he wanted to see Turkey. It was before the conquest of Istanbul, but Anatolia was already Turkish then, and. Uh, so in 1432 he joins a caravan and he travels slowly across Turkey from Syria right across to Istanbul. And he saw these in Afyon Karahisar, which is in central Turkey, and he says they're made with fresh peeled walnuts uh, on the string, and then they are bes bes he says, then they are besprinkled with boiled wine, which attaches itself to them and forms a jelly like paste all around them. It is a very agreeable food, especially when a person is hungry. Uh, and uh, Evia Chelebi says that they exported them by the camel load to Arabia, Persia, and India. And this uh, thing called sujuk, which is thickened with starch, actually this is one of the prototypes of Turkish delight, which is more or less the same thing except that instead of grape juice, you're using sugar syrup. I mean, the grape juice, of course, has a great flavour, so you can't really add other flavourings to it, but when you make it into a more luxury, sort of luxury product rather than a, a rural product, and you make it with sugar syrup, which is more expensive, then you can add whatever flavourings you like, because the sugar will allow you to uh, flavour it with lemon or rose, or uh, musk was very popular. Uh, any kind of flavouring, whereas the grape has its own flavour, you can't add anything. Um, and then, oh, this, is just, this is just a picture by Warwick Goebel, who was a famous English watercolourist, and he came to Istanbul in uh, about 1906, I think, and he made some very beautiful watercolours of Istanbul, and this is his one of a confectioner's shop with a chap stirring, probably it's his Turkish delight, uh, because it's in one of those big round bottom pans, and you can see the boxes of the Turkish Delight there. And this is a picture of a, uh, an English woman who's done her, she, she's come to Istanbul as a tourist, and she's finished doing her, she's done her shopping, which you had to go to the sweet shop by Turkish Delight. By then it was uh, very famous already. Uh, it started becoming very famous in, the, in Europe in the early 19th century, and they called it Lumps of Delight originally. And then, uh, when, I can't remember exactly when, the first person calls it Turkish Delight. I think it's about 1870, I think. I can't quite remember the date. And so one of the things tourists had to do was to go to a shop and watch him making the Turkish Delight or pulling sugar or something, and you watched it, and then you bought some to take home. And that lady, this is the Illustrated London News magazine. I don't know if... Um, 
Well, it became so famous, even Charles Dickens talks about Turkish delight in one of his novels, which is Edwin Drood. And uh, the mystery of Edwin Drood, they go to the Lumps of Delight shop, which has newly opened in the, in the town of Rochester. And they try to imitate it. We hear this from a French uh, writer called Pretextax the Comte. And he says how they've tried very hard in Europe to imitate it. And for some reason, uh, they couldn't. And the reason was that they didn't know about starch in Europe. It, in, the, in the medieval period, they had starch. And now you sort of think, well, starch, everybody has starch in their covers. But that's cornstarch, which uh, became fashionable in Europe and became widespread in the late 19th century. Now we make our blancmange of cornstarch, maize starch. But the starch uh, in Europe between the med medieval period up to the 19th century, nobody use starch in the kitchen. Like I, uh, I look through Mrs. Beaton, for example, the first edition, that's 1860, and the only talk she makes of starch at all is for starching clothes when she's ironing to make it stiff, and that's wheat starch. Originally it would be wheat starch, and the Turkish should be wheat starch. And in, um, in Germany, for example, they didn't even call starch starch, it was called hair powder. Because in Europe they used it for their wigs. You know, when wigs were fashionable, you, you, they powdered them. Not quite sure why. Um, but anyway, they did. And that was called hard powder, and that was starch. So it, a, a German confectioner who comes to Turkey and studies Turkish confectionery, his recipes, he talks about hair powder. He says, take some hair powder and put it in. And even in the dictionaries you can see that foreigners didn't know what it was. Uh, because, uh, like in the Red House Dictionary of 1890, if you look up the, the Turkish word for starch, it, uh, they don't. It, they say they use it for food because in Europe they didn't use it for food. So he, they have to say this is used for food, um, otherwise people wouldn't understand. And in Europe, because they didn't know the properties of starch and how to cook it and what that it made a jelly, they tried to make it with gelatine because they didn't realise that if you uh, treat the starch and stir it well and cook it slowly, you get a transparent jelly. So they tried to use gelatin. And that is what resulted in this, in this very strange sweet, which is still popular in England, called Turkish Delight. And I don't know if you've eaten it, but actually it's rather disgusting. Um, it's sort of covered in chocolate, and it, uh, it's this sort of strange jelly, which is a bit like Turkish Delight, but definitely isn't. And they even used to put sulfuric acid into recipes for Turkish Delight because they were experimenting with different products to try to make it work. And this stuff was began to be made, I was very surprised, 1914 was when this Fry's Turkish Delight was invented, uh, sort of to suit the European palate. And then the next subject, uh, if this is Pishmaniye. But this is called, this man, that I hope you can see him, he's a very sweet old man, and he's very proud because he's helping the family make, because this was something they made at home. <coughs> and in Kastamonu, uh, oh, what's it called? Check me how it's called Check. It has been several names in different places. So uh, in Moderno, it's Tek me helve. In uh, Kastamonu, it's Check me helve. In, in Istanbul, it's Keten helve. In, uh, Kayseri, they call it Telteni. Lots of different names, and it's because it's in tiny threads, and it was something people made at home. And this old, old the, the men did the, you, you boiled your sugar uh, to a crack, and then you let it cool slightly, and then you had to pull it to make it white. And this was, it's quite a hard work, and so the men would do that. And so you can see he's really proud, you know, that he uh, is doing. Um, this is part of the job really well. It's quite, it demands a lot of expertise. It's much harder than making baklava. And uh, so he's pulling the sugar, and when you finish pulling it and it's gone white, then you make, they make a ring of sugar, that hard, uh, well, quite hard sugar. Of course, it still has to be warm and malleable. And then, meanwhile, they've roasted flour with butter, and that's ready sitting there. So you take your ring off uh, the, sh the sh cooked sugar and you put it into the, a, 
a tray on top of the roasted flour. And then uh, three or four people sit around and they sort of gently squeeze and gently pull. But you mustn't pull so hard that it breaks, otherwise the whole thing will be wasted. And they pull and pull and that rig becomes larger and thinner. And it's picking up the roasted flour as it goes. And then they fold it over in a figure of eight. So it becomes a smaller ring, and again and again. And each time, the number of threads is getting smaller and thinner and multiplying. And uh, when I first uh, was interested in this, I wrote something about it, and I said, by the time you've done it about 40 times, it should be about 10,000 threads from the original one. And the, uh, Nihan phoned me and she said, it can't be 10,000, that's too many. So my brother-in-law was there with me and he's a physics professor. And I said, can you please work out uh, multiplying by two each time? So you've got one ring and then you, you, you fold it over, you've got two, two threads, and then four, and then eight, and then 16. I said, can you work it out if you multiply it 40 times? And he's a physics professor and he did it, and this is the result. 1 trillion, 99 billion, 511 million, 627,776. That's doing it 40 times. And when I watched it, they did it more. So the Pishman, actually what we buy uh, from Izmit, from the Pishmanie, that is only done maybe 15, 20 times. It's a little bit... The, hair, the threads are a little bit thicker, but if you get the one uh, which I hope you will taste afterwards, which is the one I think is, the, is a very good one, and it's made in Moduna, it's very fine, and they do it, I think, 45 times. And when I've watched it, uh, I've watched it make, make it twice, and when I watched it in Alanya, which is the next picture, um, this is, uh, I wish I'd made them full page, but anyway, this is a village in the south of Turkey, and they make it from honey, which is a very traditional way, I suppose, because it's a village, and Alanya was originally made in this very mountainous area. They didn't have roads until really quite recently along the coast, and so they continued making it the really ancient way with honey, and they boiled the honey, and this, again, exactly the same method, and they went on and on and on. Um, doing the folding. I, I couldn't count, but it really was a, a, a lot. And uh, anyway, they, uh, they say that the people who founded their village in the 13th century came from Horasan in northeastern Persia, sort of tip of Central Asia, and that they, the person who founded the village brought that this sweet with him, which could be because the name Pishmanie is, is Persian from Persian, Peshem meaning wool. So it's quite plausible, in fact, that that's the cor correct. And then uh, this is interesting, sherbet, because um, sherbet, of course, is just a, a fruit drink, fruit juice with sugar uh, and some water, and it's a refreshing drink. Uh, but so that you, because the fruits, of course, they only have a short season, but you want to be able to make sherbet for your guests throughout the winter, so people. Either you boil up a syrup, let's say in cherry seeds, and you boil up a syrup of sour cherries and you put that aside, and then you can quickly just put some in and add water, and there's some sugar for your guests. Or they used to make a kind of um, hard sugar, a sort of crunchy, crystallized. So if you keep stirring your fruit syrup uh, and pressing it against the sides of the pan, it crystallizes, and you end up with a nice crystallized lump that you can keep. And these sherbet became very popular in Europe. And for example, in 1577, Francesco de Mici, Italian de Mici, uh, Medici family, uh, he wrote to uh, a friend of his in, um, I think it was Venice, anyway, and he asked for recipes. Can you send me a recipe for this Turkish sherbet? So that's when it became fashionable, that's why uh, ice cream made of fruit is still called sorbet because that's from the sherbet and it became popular in England and France and they used to import the ready-made um, sort of 
little squares, like lemon, violet, whatever, rose. They used to import them, and there's some uh, records of the uh, customs from the 17th century with showing these imports of this stuff from Turkey. And first they made it with that, and then they found a cheap method, which was to use citric acid, and so you do, so then you can make it yourself and you do away with the expensive fruit and you just put making sugar and citric acid and and they started putting bicarbonate of soda in it for some reason and so it became fizzy and in England, I don't know whether it, other countries have this but we, in England they still have this sherbet sweets and they're all fizzy and they're basically, they're all called sherbet and they're made from the powder. That's the original Turkish one. It's the only one you can still get today. It's the one flavoured with cloves. And they use it when women have just had a baby. So you make your sherbet out of it and give it to guests and she drinks. It's supposed to be good. Uh, but you can't get the other flavours anymore. But in England you have all these strange sweets like sherbet dabs. And I don't know if you've ever you've eaten them. I, I used to like them a lot. Uh, this strange kind of powder and you put a stick of licorice in it and you dip it into the sherbet powder and it fizzes in your mouth. Mm. And then the next one I decided to talk about is the horos shekeri they're called in Turkish, which is the cockerel sweet and they're animal lollipops. And who knows where they came from, probably, uh, probably they uh, originally these moulded um, things in the shapes of animals uh, this is an opinion of another food, food historian. He reckons probably they came originally from the Middle East. Uh, but nobody really knows. But in Turkey they were made from at least the 16th century. And these are, I'm afraid, they're rather stale ones that I have made. Uh, and they've, they've, gone, they've lost their transparency. But I just wanted to um, show you that they used to make them with whistles. And oh, it doesn't oh, you remember that? Yeah. Well, there's only one man in Turkey who still bothers to put the whistles on them, and there's only two who make them at all. One is in Bergen, but I think that's broken. Uh, let me see if I can get one, because they've, they've gone, I'm afraid they're rather stale. And um, one chap in Bursa, he, he bothers to make the whistles. And they whistle, actually, but I think I can't get them out of the packet. The whistles are coming off. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, because they've got stale sitting there. I, yeah, it's a shame. No, I didn't really mean Actually, they make a jolly good whistle when they work. Um, and the other chap, he, pulled, he says they're too fiddly. And he doesn't get many customers, you know, because they're a bit old-fashioned. The kids want chocolate bars. And so they're only really, he's still, his only customers are weddings where it's a tradition, and so he, he can't, it's, it's a fiddly to make the whistle, so he says he can't be bothered because anyway he doesn't send enough, poor chap. But this other one, he has more customers, I think. Yeah, it gives you an idea anyway. And uh, so they used to have, uh, anyway, so these are two, that's the traditional cockerel shape, but also they have things like horsemen, and these are the dub their double moulds. And th this, these three pictures, which you can't see, unfortunately, this is the chap in Bergamo who still makes them. He makes them in his sitting room. And uh, he has actually some very nice, interesting shapes. But because he can't sell enough, he just makes the small ones, which he can sell a bit cheaper. And he makes it, you put, boil up the sugar and the colour it red, or you can just leave it white, but it turns yellow autumn like This isn't a yellow colouring, actually. I think, it, as far as I know, it's the... This does look a bit like yellow colouring, but I think they do get a yellowish tinge naturally from the sugar, in fact, when you boil it. You just leave it. And he makes it in his city, or he boils up the sugar and colours it red, and he pours it into the double mould, and pours it in, and then pours it out immediately. And so you get a hollow, actually there isn't a lot of sugar in it. And then you stick the stick on the edge and wait for it to cool and then take them out. And uh, the point of them, in fact, uh, the point of them being hollow is that you're not getting a lot of sugar. 
which makes them a cheap sweet that any kid could afford. Whereas if you filled up the whole thing and didn't bother to empty it, you would get something maybe a little bit more durable. You could wouldn't break so easily. But the kid, you know, a child, how much sugar can you really lick off a thick lollipop? Like if it was animal shaped like that. I mean, you they might take lick it for half an hour, and then their tongue's going to get sore, and they're going to get bored, and they're just going to throw it away. So it's going to be expensive. Plus it's wasteful. Whereas these ones were. Because they're hollow, there's just enough sugar for a small child to have fun with and blow the whistle a bit. Uh, so it makes lots of sense to have them hollow. And uh, the, apparently, this is the other man from Bursa who, who makes them with the whistles, the ones who made, the chap who made these. And, hold on, where is it? Ha! Ah, this is a picture I got off the internet. Apparently in Germany, for Easter, they make them the same way, again, hollow, and they call them red sugar hairs. Uh, I hope you don't know German. Rotter, Zucker. Hazen. 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 Huh. So it's exactly the same thing. So it sort of spread a long way. Who knows where it came to Turkey from, or where it went, but it sort of spread quite a lot. Uh, but there aren't many makers left any longer. And this is uh, a picture uh, that I was very excited to find. And it's in Manchester University in an album. And because there is a, a, a chap who describes little figures made of sugar of, of animals and birds in the 16th century, early 16th century, but you can't sort of see them. It's just a few sentences. But in this album, there is a picture of a, a seller, a confectioner selling them. And uh, it's a pity you can't really see it very big. But anyway, he's got, a, you know, one of those bottle gourds. A, 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 one that's dried up, and he's got holes in it, and he's stuck. He's stuck these, of course, without the cellophane. He's stuck these into the holes, and he's got a pole attached to the bottle gourd, and he's going. He's obviously a street seller selling his lollipops to children. And this is 1660, which is very early, it, because these kind of sweets, they're, they're sort of street sweets. They're not something that gets recorded in palace you know, records and things like that. And so that's it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.